Welcome to Stories from the NNI. I'm Lisa Friedersdorf, Director of the National Nanotechnology Coordination Office. Today, it's my pleasure to welcome Delia Milliron, the T. Brockett Hudson Professor of Chemical Engineering and the Bill L. Stanley Endowed Leadership Chair of the Department of Chemical Engineering at the University of Texas at Austin. Delia, thank you so much for joining us today. To get us started, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and how you first got involved in nanotechnology? Yeah, sure. So I've been working in the area of materials chemistry really since I was an undergraduate. And I was always interested in working on research problems that could positively impact society. So I got intrigued by nanotechnology. In part, I was inspired by the work on disensitized solar cells from Brian O'Regan working with Michael Gretzel. Um, which I picked up on a little bit in the later years of my undergraduate experience. And then I was really intrigued by the idea that a material's properties could be tuned just by changing its size and its shape, not only by changing its composition. And, And that really got me started. So I noticed on your group website, you have solutions of nanomaterials in vials with different colors, which is kind of the classic illustration of how size can impact properties. Can you talk a little bit about some of the applications that you're looking at and maybe just a little bit behind those vials? Sure. The materials that we work on are almost entirely colloidal nanocrystals. So that's what you're seeing in those photos. They're small crystals of inorganic materials, for us, mostly metal oxides that are suspended as a dispersion in different solvents. And I guess the the classic images from my field, from colloidal nanocrystals, where we see color tuning in vials, might be quantum dots, uh, which is really how I got my start in nanotechnology. But the materials we work on these days are mostly plasmonic materials. So we're tuning their interaction with light and therefore their color by changing their composition and by changing the size and shape of the materials. But it's the absorption properties that we're tuning and therefore the transmission, what you see coming through the vial with your eye rather than the light emission like you might be looking at with quantum dots. Can you discuss some of the applications for these colloidal nanocrystals? So we've been most motivated recently by applications of our nanocrystals in smart window coatings. In specific, these would be electrochromic windows, which just means that we make a coating of nanocrystals on glass. It's part of an electrochemical cell. And when we add and remove charge to that coating of nanocrystals through an electrochemical reaction, it changes the tint on the glass or the transmittance Um, the amount of sunlight that comes in through windows into buildings, cars, trains, and so on. So that's been really driving a lot of our materials development, both on the fundamental properties of the materials and, and obviously working towards the practical applications. So this is one of my favorite applications of nanotechnology. Well, I have a lot of favorites, but this one I think is super exciting to be able to reduce energy costs by changing the transmission of the window film. Can you discuss how they are made? Is it a sandwich where there's a material inside and you mentioned an electrochemical cell? So can you just describe a little bit what that means? Yeah, it's a layered device. It actually has the same architecture as a battery. So an anode on one side, a cathode on the other side, and an electrolyte in the middle. The biggest difference being that the whole thing has to be transparent. And the figures of merit or the properties we're trying to optimize for have to do with the color, not just with the charge storage. So the device works by applying a small voltage, just a few volts as you would for a battery, and moving charge between the anode and the cathode. But the difference is, again, that we're interested in the color change in those materials as we charge it up. So when you look at applications in large scale windows, is this like a double pane window where you have this electrochemical cell between the glass? And then how do you apply that voltage to change the color? Yeah, it would be best applied in a dual pane or even a triple pane window but the device would be embedded in one of the panes of glass. And then the rest of the window is constructed in the usual way with an air gap, you know, potentially filled with argon for insulation and, and so forth. Within the device, I guess the layers I did not already mention are the conducting layers. So you need a way to get charge in and out of the device. And you would do that through films of transparent conductors that support both the anode and the cathode, 
those would be wired to metallic bus bars on the edge of the window embedded in the frame so that you don't see them. And then you could wire that into your thermostat, for example, so that you could get control over your building, both the heating, the air conditioning, and the windows all in a holistic way. That's sort of the long-term vision of how this could be integrated to make buildings more efficient. So you're in a chemical engineering department. What is the makeup of your lab? What disciplines do your students come from? Can you share a little bit of detail there? Sure. My students over the years have been material science and engineering students, chemistry students, both you know physical chemistry with a background in spectroscopy and also more inorganic synthetic chemistry for making materials, and then also, of course, chemical engineers. And Currently, it's about half and half chemistry and chemical engineering students, but again, a, a diversity among those. Uh, so it's, it's a real blend, and I think that's essential to the work that we do. When we look at applications of nanomaterials, and you talked a little bit about quantum dots and nanocrystals, the history of quantum dots goes back some time, and we're seeing mass market applications and big displays and bright screens and that type of thing. When you look back at nanotechnology, where do you see some of the most exciting advancements from your perspective? And then looking forward, what are you most excited about with respect to the role nanotechnology can have in the future? Yeah, I think quantum dots becoming realized on a commercial scale is, is very exciting for everybody in the field. And in lots of practical as well as inspirational ways, it sets the path before us for future commercialization, hopefully including our nanocrystal-based uh, smart window devices. And I think if you look at the progress that was made in quantum dots in order to achieve their current success, it's been a story that's that's typical of materials as a whole, maybe over a longer time scale, more than a century, which is simplifying, purifying, making things more pure, less defective. And that's been crucial to the, the beautiful optical performance that we have in today's quantum dot televisions. And if you look to the future, I think just like with materials where, for example, with semiconductors, we had to learn to purify them before we could learn to controllably introduce the defects that enable microelectronics. Same thing with nanotechnology. I think the future is controlled reintroduction of complexity. So putting together multiple types of nanoscale building blocks to achieve more complex functions and controlling the introduction deliberately introducing defects into crystals. So now that we know how to make them pure and as uniform and simple kind of as possible, let's make them more complex, but in ways that are deliberate and where we understand the impact of those controlled defects. So controlled reintroduction of complexity. I love that phrase. So instead of looking at different types of generation, you're looking at reducing use and energy Absolutely. efficiencies. So looking from that perspective, what do you think the role of this technology will have going forward? Yeah, I think it's essential that we work on both sides of the energy equation, that we find renewable and more sustainable ways to supply our energy needs, but also slow down um, and even, where possible, reverse our demand for energy, um, make uh, all processes that we can uh, less energy intensive. So just taking buildings, buildings constitute almost 40% of the energy use in the U.S., and that's pretty typical for industrialized countries. The other two major sectors are industry and transportation. And I think, you know, we're, we're coming up with strategies to reduce the carbon intensity of industrial processes. Uh, we've got electric vehicles coming online for transportation. And with buildings, it's fragmented, but a large portion of that energy use goes to thermal control. So heating, ventilation, air conditioning, and to lighting. And these are two sectors where sunlight in the form of, you know, heat and visible light coming in through our windows has a real potential to reduce the energy intensity of our buildings. So I think all of these things are, are going to have to come together to be successful in the energy transition. I also want to say I think it's important that we don't just look to these kind of technological solutions to make a successful transition and assume that 
everything else can go on as usual. If we are going to support, which I think is an imperative, a basic quality of life for more and more people around the globe, it's going to mean restructuring the way we do business as well, the way our society operates, uh, to have reductions in consumption by wealthy people, wealthy nations. And that can't be dependent solely on technology. Technology can help, but our expectations about how we interact and how we work, for example, are also going to have to change. What advice do you have for students that are interested in nanotechnology or STEM broadly? For students interested in STEM, it's essential that you get really strong foundational skills in core disciplines. So math, physics, chemistry, that you don't try to skip past those and go to, you know, the exciting stuff or just learn about technology. But I also think it's essential to learn about the intersection of social science with STEM disciplines. And this is needed to understand the full scope of the problems that you're trying to solve and also to have your eyes open and know how to analyze who's benefiting and maybe who's negatively impacted by potential solutions so that you can have a more holistic evaluation of whatever solutions you're thinking of developing or contributing to. The other reason that's really important is that technologies are only as effective as the way society integrates them and reacts to them. Um, so I, I think, you know, the COVID pandemic has been illuminating in so many ways, but one of them is the great success that was rapid development of these vaccines, which is incredible. Um, and they're so effective in terms of what they do, but they're only as effective in bringing the pandemic to a resolution as our ability to distribute them and people's willingness to accept the vaccines and get vaccinated. And so the way that we combine technological solutions with the societal realm, the social science realm, public health practices is really everything in terms of having the impact that we envision when we're coming up with these ideas for new technologies. Well, Delia, I've really enjoyed our conversation today. Do you have any closing thoughts that you'd like to share with our listeners? You know, if you're interested in having an impact on society through technology, as I am, that you also pay attention along the way to the impact you're having on the people around you, because you're sure to have that impact, um, regardless of what may happen with your ambitions uh, in science and technology. We know we can impact the people that we work with, and I encourage everyone to pay attention to that aspect of life as you go. 